Hey guys, I'm Lauren and welcome back to the Living Love Community. This is my husband, Austin. And we just wanted to come today to kind of dig into scripture with you guys. A couple days ago, I did a video and I just really talked about how to study scripture, how to get into God's word and really know how it applies to our life based on the context that it was written in, which is a really cool thing to kind of dig into. I'll place that video link below so you guys can watch that. But today we're going to start going through Romans, all of Romans. Today we're just going to do one and two. Yeah, I was so excited. Uh, Lauren invited me to jump into some uh, Bible study with y'all, and I really wanted to do that, so I was really excited to hear that. Hopefully, you'll see me on a regular basis, um, and I'll just come in and hopefully be able to highlight some big picture things that um, the scriptures are telling us, and then also hopefully giving a little application, because that's what's helped my walk, and I know that's what's helped Lauren's walk. How do we actually apply this now? So, let's just go ahead and dig right into scripture. Okay, so we are going to be going through Romans. I mentioned that earlier. One of the things that I love about the Bible is that it was written by real people in real places experiencing very real things. So that's like the coolest thing to be able to actually dig in and understand what these things that were going on were. So Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. If you don't know who the Apostle Paul is, look him up. So basically, he was writing a letter to Roman believers. Some were Jewish believers, some were Gentile believers, and they didn't really get along the best. So basically, Paul was just trying to unite them, and he was also trying to give them a direct way to be able to then share the gospel with other people. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about context, let's move on to the actual scripture. So we're not going to read all of the passage just for time's sake, but we would really encourage you guys to get in, to read this, to learn what these words are saying, but we're just going to do a really quick overview. One of the first main points that Paul hits in the letter is that Jesus is the actual promised Messiah and that all the believers that are in Jesus are called to be his saints. So the next section, Paul is really talking about how he has a desire and a longing to go and meet these brothers and sisters in Rome. That way he can help them better sharpen their faith and so that then they can go and share the gospel with their own community. Another big point that Paul hits is how he calls us to not be ashamed of the gospel. And we're actually going to talk about that in a little bit more detail a little bit later down the line. Now a scary point um, that Paul really hits is not only do we suppress the truth of God, we actually try to replace him. So we try to see God um, just in people, or we'll try to put it into grave images or things that we've created instead of the actual God. Okay, so kind of getting into chapter two, God reveals that because of these human inclinations that we have to reject him and replace him, that means that he is the only one who can actually be a righteous judge, right? He's the only one who can actually judge us. And part of that judgment is allowing us to succumb to our own sinful desires. In this last point, Paul talks about the law. And now, without us being sinners, there would be no need for the law. So we have the law from God to show us that we need him. But here's the thing, since we are sinners, none of us can complete the law. So we need Jesus' righteousness uh, because we have none of our own. Okay, so that was just like a really quick overview of chapters one and two. Again, I really encourage you guys to get into the scriptures and actually read it for yourself to see exactly what God is teaching you in this. But we want to go back to verse, chapter one, verses 16 through 17. It's just two verses, but are really powerful verses and mean a lot. Yeah, uh, it's the unashamed uh, section. It says, the righteous shall live by faith. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. If we look at the context of this letter, it's very clear that in this time, people were probably ashamed of the gospel. To say that you were a Christian would actually mean condemnation judgment uh, and probably things that affect things like your livelihood financial stability things that we hold fast to america in our context sometimes saying a christian could be seen as a good thing in culture but in this society it was not you would not bear the cross of christ unless you were literally willing to die or lose something for it 
So this idea of being unashamed of the gospel has actually been like a pretty big deal in American cultural context. I mean, things like the Christian rap culture has been huge in saying like we're unashamed to share about the gospel. We're unashamed to preach the gospel, to share the gospel through our own personal messages. So that's something that we've heard a lot, but then whenever you really kind of work through and you really think through in your own personal life, how am I living unashamed of the gospel? That can be pretty convicting. One example that I kind of thought of last night as we were reading through this and, and just praying about this was that, you know, whenever we're little kids, some of us, like, I have a little sister. Some of us had other friends or maybe people that we didn't really want to be seen hanging out with for all of our other cool friends, right? So I have a little sister. Whenever she kind of got to the age, whenever we were around each other more, I would kind of steer my friends away from her, right? Because she was not cool enough to hang out with us. <laughs> but anyway, so I would steer my friends away from her, and um, that would kind of create this division between the two of us. And unfortunately, not only did that kind of hurt our relationship in public, but that hurt our relationship in private, right? She knew that I was embarrassed of her. She knew that I didn't want to be hanging out with her. Um, and then later on, whenever I did want her, whenever I did want her around, it took some healing that had to take place. And kind of in the same way, whenever we are ashamed of the gospel, not only are we hiding and, and hindering our relationship with God in front of others, that's really going to make a difference in the way that we interact with him on our own day-to-day -day basis, right? We're going to be less likely to get in the scriptures. Our private relationship is going to be reflected in our public relationship as well. So when someone says the gospel, what is the gospel? That's a great question. And we understand that Paul in this context is saying that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ is who he is. His biblical life, death, resurrection, return, faith in that. Um, that we would be children of God, that we would be uh, sons of God. And so because of the gospel, you have to understand there's implications that come with that. So if this is true, then what does this mean about scripture, right? What does this mean about God telling us to steer away from things that we desire so passionately? Um, there's things that we also can't be ashamed about the gospel. Even God talking about um, us pleasing him or not pleasing him. Me being a sinner, that's a part of the gospel. I would be ashamed of the gospel if I were to live a life to tell people, I don't sin anymore. That was that was my past life. Or um, sin's not an issue. That's not being unashamed. If I was really unashamed of the gospel, I would be able to look at non-believers and say, hey, guess what? I'm struggling with sin too. Lord is convicting me of sin and walking with me. And guess what? He's wanting me to be more in his image. That's being unashamed as well. We can't just see as unashamed as yelling at people and being loud and boisterous and uh, really aggressive. Are we called to those moments sometimes? Sometimes. I mean, we can see it in scripture, John the Baptist and uh, other uh, apostles in the past. But we have to make sure we're not ashamed of the implications of the gospel as well. And I think that's something as believers we really have to be prayerful about. So guys, one thing that I want to challenge you all to do over the next week or so is to really get into these scriptures and read them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide chapters 1 and 2 up from now until next Sunday whenever we come back to you guys with chapters 3 and 4. I'm going to be dividing those up so that you guys can actually get in and look through that. So because of this scripture that was laid before us, we should be looking at these verses and every other book of the Bible, every other word that is laid in scripture, that whatever it says, whether the world agrees with it or not, that we are to be unashamed of it because it is Jesus who has come and saved us from our shame, right? He's taken us away from the shame and we don't have to be slave to that, right? We don't, we can be free from the shame that sin has entangled us with. So just because the world doesn't agree with something that scripture says, of course it's hard, right? Of course we want to please the world. That's in our sinful human nature. That's what we want to do. But what we think that the scripture is asking us to do is to shy away from that, right? To get away from that, that slavery of shame that the world has given us and be free and unashamed in Jesus who has actually given us life rather than death.
this is bad. <laughs> no, 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 no! <laughs> Jesus.